Welcome to Your AHA Life. I'm your host, Dr. Tanya Harris Cornelius. The AHA Life is a life of more joy, more purpose, and more fulfillment. Through these episodes, I will bring you stories of insight and inspiration to help you live the life that you dream about, the life that you are meant to live, your AHA life. Enjoy the episode. Well, hello, I am Tanya Cornelius, and I'm back with your AHA Life. I want to welcome you today, and I have a guest, I would say someone I've been waiting and waiting to have on the show with me because she means so much to me. I want to welcome you, Dr. Cheryl Jordan, uh, to your AHA Life. Hey, Cheryl. Hi, Tanya. How are you? I am wonderful. I'm wonderful. And um, I'm in Connecticut. I know you're in Atlanta. How's the weather there? It's pretty chilly. It, it is. Uh, and when I say pretty chilly for Atlanta, it's yeah. probably in, like maybe 50 degrees or the low 50s. So, so yeah. Uh, that so, would be know, a little it, warm for us today. I wish I had 50 degree weather. I, I asked because I know you all had a storm that came through Atlanta recently. Yes, we did. Um, yeah. um, I was not affected by it other than when I walked out my front door, there were leaves and small twigs and branches everywhere. Yeah. Um, there actually uh, were some deaths. Uh, I think maybe. Oh three my gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, it it know may that. have been, it was in, I believe, the metropolitan area. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And my, um, my neighbor upstairs said that it sounded like someone was trying to break into her, uh, her apartment, but. I slept through it. (laughs) Oh, you slept slept through it. Well, you know what, then that's good. That sounds like uh, Jesus uh, sleeping on the boat uh, while the storm was going on outside. So anyway, let's get, let's get on with the show. Um, Before we get started, uh, I want to read your bio that you sent to me and, and then uh, I'll ask you to fill in any, any blanks or open spots that you'd like to, to share. But um, to our viewers and listeners, um, Cheryl, Dr. Cheryl Jordan, is the founder and CEO of U.Magine Performance Consulting. With over 30 years of experience, of experience developing talent to meet the immediate and emerging needs of the business, Cheryl is a change agent leadership and team development consultant, and an executive coach with a proven track record for demonstrating creative, innovative, and progressive thought leadership. Cheryl is committed to evolving leaders, teams, and especially women, which we're gonna be talking about today, to achieve states of actualization and a sustained passion for seeing the possibilities in their professional lives. Cheryl has presented internationally on the topic of women in leadership, diversity and inclusion, and managing change and transition. And it seems like, Cheryl, today we're going to be mixing the stew with Mm -hmm. all of those things, uh, all of those topics uh, in our talk today. She researched African American women's leadership in corporations and co authored. The Role of Societal Privilege in the Definitions and Practices of Inclusion. Cheryl has been a mentor to numerous women leaders searching for meaning, fulfillment, and self-actualization in their professional lives. Cheryl, I'm so excited to have you join me on your AHA Life. It took us a while to get all of this scheduled, but you're here with with me today, and I'm really happy. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. I am. And I have to say this, I'm loving the turtleneck. The blue, that color looks amazing. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's turtle. You know what? The weather, it's still kind of this ping pong weather here in Connecticut right now. So I'm wearing a turtleneck today and a couple of days I might be back in, you know, short sleeves. It's, Uh It's still kind of going back and forth but yeah it's it's definitely with the change of seasons and the change of the leaves on on trees we're definitely into fall season uh here yeah 
So in terms of your bio, anything else that you would like to share with uh, the Your AHA Life audience today? So I, I could talk about accomplishments and achievements um, and what I have done, um, but I would like to share that I am still a work in progress, that there is so much more growth and transformation and evolution that needs to take place within, within Cheryl's body, within her mind. And, uh, and so, which makes the journey of life exciting knowing that, but I know that the, the bio is static and that I'm creating that bio as I move along. And I know that given all of the conditions and the things that, we're ha that are happening in our world right now and in our nation, that I need to continue to sharpen the saw. Um, that as things change, I need to continue to change as well and to adapt and to be resilient. So I am a work in progress. The other thing I would add is I'm a proud mother. Uh, you know, I love my son, Iman. Yes. And uh, he is my sage and sometimes my mentor. And, uh, and I would that's say- so interesting how our kids start to mentor us? Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I have to say, okay, Iman, you're the child. And then <laughs> I find myself saying, but you know what you just said? It made perfect sense. And yeah. you are absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's also a product of you raising him to be such an incredible young man and a great talent uh, in the world. And um, so, yeah, you're a great mom. I'm so glad you brought that up. And also this whole notion of becoming, right? This whole notion of you saying work in progress. I love that too, Cheryl. Um, so I want to give my, my readers, uh, you know, kind of a, a little bit of insight into our relationship and um, Cheryl and I go back, and we are, we are great friends. Uh, we met when we both worked at Turner, uh, and um, we worked together in, in human resources there, and then worked on the same team together. And, you know, I always say that um, while I might have been, like, the, the manager at one point, Cheryl, in, in the scheme of the universe, the universe doesn't care, like, these all these kind of man-made you know relationships mm -hmm. the universe just saw fit that mm. we would travel together yes we would yes. travel this path together and support one another and learn from one another and um that's what you've been to me i've learned a lot so much from you and you've been an encourager and a supporter a confidant and I'm just so happy to have you on the show today talking about women leaders and, you know, just the role of women leaders as women take on greater roles of leadership mm -hmm. uh, in our organizations today and how their leadership might um, look differently from their male counterparts, number one, and just how society um, shapes women leaders. Um, and I love that you did research on particularly women of color, African American uh, women. Yes. And we're just going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So if you're listening and watching this, and you know, I, I hope that you will, I know that you will get a lot out of listening to Dr. Cheryl Jordan, affectionately, just Cheryl to, to me. And, uh, only Cheryl, um, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, so, um, so yeah, if the, I mean, if there's anything else you want to want to say, Cheryl, to that before we jump in, but I, um, I just wanted to kind of give an insight into how we are connected. Yes, yes. And I'd have to say that um, the relationship has been one of the most important relationships uh, to me, uh, not only just in my professional career, you know, but even just in terms of, you know, uh, just personal, uh, you have been just phenomenal. She's great. She's great. Uh -huh. What else can I say? And a great, a great mentor. And, you know, I find myself at times in situations repeating things that I remember you saying, because I was like your apprentice, right? I was your apprentice. And, you know, so people will support what they help to create. Yes. I say that all the time, <laughs> all the time. 
I, I so, didn't make it up. I didn't make it up, but it is definitely a, a, a mantra that I have used throughout my professional career. Yeah. yeah. And, and I like what you, you said about fit, you know, because we can have these titles and, yeah. uh, because I believe that we just feel like we have to create these boxes, right? And sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. Um, sometimes, you know, they're permeable, right? Sometimes you can move through these boxes and really have this true relationship. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's what, I, that's what I had with you. Yeah, that's what we've been able to do. Like yes. move yes. the boxes out of the way and just develop true friendship, um, relationship, Uh, We are professional. We bounce ideas off of each other on professional as well as personal capacity. So we have a little bit of a love fest going on here. So we do. Let's get to it, right? Yeah, let's get to it. Let's get to it. So I I, I do want to I do want to jump in because you um, we work together at Turner, but then you transitioned and you were a change and transition, um, you know, expert, if you will, and. So how has it been since you made the transition um, from corporate life to your own entrepreneurial uh, business? So, um, you know, I was thinking about when I first moved to Atlanta back in uh, 1999, I was looking for a job and uh, I interviewed with a major corporation here and they sent me to an IO psychologist, right? And I had to take this, a battery of tests and what came from it is that I was a, the perfect, I had the perfect profile to be an entrepreneur. Well, at that time, you know, there was no way that I was going to even accept that because I needed to find a job. And that was what was important to me at the time. And so now almost like uh, I would say 15 or 16 years later, I end up starting my own business, which has been very exciting. I mean, there are peaks, you know, and there are valleys with it. And I can talk a little bit about some of the peaks is that I'm big on autonomy. Uh, I love being able to create. um, And, uh, and then once I create not to have to go through multiple levels of approval before it is accepted. Uh, Not to say that, which is very often the case when you're working in an Mm -hmm. enterprise, you know, a, a, a corporation um, often there's at least one, two or three levels of approval to go through. Yes, yes. yes. So, um, so I love that part of it. Um, I love the, uh, I work for NGOs. I've worked private industry, different, um, businesses that have different focus. Um, I enjoy that as well. So I feel like I am, more in an open system, you know, because I'm, like, yeah. I'm more of a systems thinking person. So, you know, in, in corporate, sometimes I feel that you, um, you know, you, you buy into the culture, which is okay where, where you are, and you may be limited in terms of getting different ideas because eventually, you know, especially if you hire the same people through the interview process, because a lot of times that's what we're doing, yeah. right? Instead of really, we're saying we want thought leaders, we want zero gravity thinkers, um, but we hire people who are like ourselves. And uh, and so how do you learn and grow if you don't have these differences? And so I think having my own business also provides me with that as well. Um, And you just get a lot more like exposure and variety to to a variety of types of businesses as well, right? Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, uh, so from telecommunications to technology, you know, to media, entertainment, you know, to nonprofits um, that are uh, promoting voting in the state of Georgia. I mean, it's been, you know, it's been all of that. So it's been great. Yeah. So what I miss is sometimes the community that I just talked about. Right. Um, So it takes more energy uh, and I have to work harder at staying connected and connected to new ideas, connected to, um, I mean, I can read a book, but you can read a book, but not until you're in it and you're practicing it and you're seeing it, you know, it doesn't mean as much. And so um, it is harder for that, for me to do. Yeah. 
Well, that makes a that makes a lot of sense, and there are always going to be some pros and cons, or you know, things that you gain and things that you kind of leave behind when you make changes yeah. in in life. And um, but you're doing quite well, and you are doing work that you're passionate about doing, and I think that that is just really awesome for you, Cheryl. So let's, I mean, this is called your aha life. So what maybe has been an aha since leaving uh, corporate? Any, something you've kind of, uh, you um, know, really been a big lesson for you? So I think that with having my own business and since, you know, since leaving corporate is that I have more time to reflect. I'm, I have more time to really get to know me, to know my strengths and to know my fears, you know, to know what makes me tick uh, and to know what can like knock me, knock, that can knock the wind out of me. And, uh, and so one of, so for example, and you and I've had this conversation where uh, dealing with rejection, there's yeah. a different, like if you know that you're having a, a conversation with this client and your food and your, your mortgage and all your bills are dependent on making this happen and you get rejected. It's been, that's been difficult. Yeah. Um, but then and also I like what you said about the fit earlier about our relationship, because that is very, I think appropriate for even describing that not every client is for Cheryl. Not every client is for me. And so what I have to do is to learn to let go, uh, to move forward and to believe that the, we live in a very abundant universe that is there, that is trying to support my goals and my purpose. Right. right. Um, so that's, that's been one of the, the biggest learnings for me. The other is that, you know, you can be a jack of, what is it, of all trades and a master yeah. of none. Well, I'm learning to become a master of all these things because I, I, you know, I wasn't an instructional designer. I'm doing more instructional design. Um, it's not my most favorite thing to do, um, but it's something that I've had to do in creating these leadership programs that I've developed. Yeah. Um, and uh, being a consultant, being a coach, at times being an advisor, at times being the mentor, um, and having to negotiate. And I just think that women in general, we have a difficult time recognizing our value. And I see that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, you know, and sometimes you're navigating these things um, as a solopreneur, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. creating a sense of community that you can go to when you are um, going through those things must be, you know, extremely valuable to an entrepreneur who is a, a solopreneur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's difficult, which is why you've gotten calls from me. You know? <laughs> and, you know, and then of course, Dr. Goodley, the same thing. He's gotten calls from me. Um, uh, I talked to Art, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. And you know who I'm, the individuals I'm talking about. Yeah, these about. friends, yeah, that we have. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Helpful. absolutely. Yeah, it just, I just thought about it. But so let's talk about um, coaching. So Cheryl, you, uh, even when you were working inside of corporate, you were working with a lot of coaches and you mm -hmm. yourself were coaching leaders um, mm -hmm. and mentoring others. And so it seemed perhaps like a natural transition for you, but how did you decide that that's what you were going to do when you left, um, when you left your corporate uh, life, so to speak? And, and how did you decide that, yes, you wanted to go into coaching and then specifically now you're evolving more to working um, with women leaders? Mm -hmm. I believe that coaching and mentoring, you know, even though I know that they're different, but that it's always been in my DNA. It's always been in my DNA. Um, even before I, you know, became a coach or basically started calling myself a coach, right? I was, I designated myself as a coach. Yeah. I have always been one to be interested in helping others to self-actualize 
that is, I believe, you know, when people talk about their purpose, you know, like, like my, I've never, and I was, I was having this conversation with someone the other day about, I was never really into I, my title or, you know, um, becoming an executive, like that was not a part, I just want to make a difference. That has always been me. And, um, and I remember as a child being that way, uh, definitely as a teenager. I mean, I went through some rough, rough moments as a teenager when I recognized the sensitivities that I was born with and looking at them in a way where uh, I felt, I wish I wasn't that way, but I was being, I was just being prepared for what I do. And, uh, and I think the first time that um, I recognized the, um, that ability was probably when I became a mother, actually. And we all do this. I mean, you have had to mentor, you've had to coach your children, right? You've had to, you know, like maybe you facilitate helping them to think about, well, what is it that you think you should do about this homework assignment? I mean, things as basic as that. Yeah. And, um, and then uh, I will say that when I started working in human resources years ago, uh, I was involved in, I was on some advisory boards and one was the Urban League. Uh, it was a job skills training program and it was women who were trying to start their lives all over again. Mm -hmm. And I, I loved working with them because I could relate to them because we had similar experiences, me as a single parent. And a lot of them were single parents. Yeah. Yeah. It's so amazing when we, you know, um, when we're going through our lives and, and you start to see how all these puzzle pieces are fitting together. Like you said, and you, and you're opening that, um, you are a work in progress and we're always progressing, right? That's the goal is to continue to, um, progress, but these, all of your life experiences start making sense. I don't know, you know, that's how I feel about my life too. You're just, you kind of just going along and then, you know, you have this aha that these experiences were always kind of just get puzzle pieces coming into place to create the life that you now get to truly, you know, live and bring all those things to bear. So the fact that you are an empath, you feel deeply, you're very a, a very compassionate uh, leader and person. The fact that you um, are, a, uh, you know, are a single mom and that you raised your, your wonderful son um, as a single mother. And um, so you have, um, you're very empathetic and understanding of women who are juggling a lot, you know, and particularly single moms who are juggling a lot. And now you just kind of go full, full steam on and, and saying that, you know, you, you have your corporate career, you, you finish your doctoral studies. I mean, just continue to achieve. And now here you are running your own business an executive coach and consultant to many types of organizations and you work with men and women but your heart and your passion is taking you right back to women, women. and um just the focus on on women as leaders because you you can speak from speak to them and and with them and understand them because you have lived that your yourself I think that's just pretty cool how our lives unfold like that and how your life seemingly has unfolded mm -hmm. to bring you right where you're supposed to be at this time. Yeah. And sending the people to you to help you to get there. Yeah. The people that may see something in you that maybe you didn't always see in yourself to say, you know what, this is your path. I I'm going to give you what you need, you know, to help you get to this point. And I've had that. I've been fortunate to have people in my life like that, you know, especially moving to Atlanta. It changed, it changed my world actually. And I feel like, you know, I grew up here in the city, even though I was an adult when I moved here. Mm. Um, so you're right, but it's putting all those pieces together and I can go back and think, ah, when this happened to me when I was 14 and I cried, okay, 
it made me stronger and it made me be even more protective of people that may have even more of a sensitive spirit or they're trying to fit in like women trying to fit in, yeah. you know, trying to uh, belong, you know, like I belong here. Yeah. I'm not just here. I belong here. So, so yeah. I belong yeah. here and I am mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. I am enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's talk about leadership. Let's talk about, you know, what you might see as, um, like you, you have coach and you still do coach men and women. What are you mm -hmm. see as some of the biggest differences in, you know, in men leaders and, and women leaders? So with coaching and I can start with where the issues are or what the needs are. And usually with men, it's more about, I have this behavior that I need to change, right? Okay. You know, maybe it's not about feeling like they're not accepted or that they don't belong, but it is, how can I change this behavior? How can I work better with my team? You know, we're going through change. You know, can you help me navigate that change? I was just promoted. So I need, you know, some type of onboarding. Can you help me with that? With women, it gets back to the word I used before, belonging, the, the words that you use, self-worth and value and knowing that uh, and constantly questioning, you know, it's like, it's like this exis existential crisis, you know, it's a constantly questioning, you know, am I doing the right thing? How do I fit in? You know, how do I create a, a space where my voice is heard, where people hear me, where I'm valued? Uh, that's what I hear, regardless of the level of, of women, because I've coached, you know, like direct or uh, mid-level um, uh, managers, senior level, level managers, and I've coached some C-suite. Um, I had a C-suite, uh, uh, she was chief operating officer, it was a smaller company, but they, they, I was asked to come in to help her because she was, um, her behaviors were extreme. They were extreme. She was, you know, um, attacking, very authoritarian, you know. Okay. Um, and I remember her telling me, no one ever told me, I, I emu emulated what I saw. I didn't know that I had these natural abilities as a woman. I am collaborative, you know. I you know, I can connect the dots better. I mean, you know, and women do, they connect the dots better. They're more systemic thinkers. You know, they see the bigger picture and, um, and then they see the details, right? She didn't know. Yeah, so yeah. that's- I, I think that's for so many women leaders, and it's something probably that I rejected earlier in my career to, I, thankfully now to, to my benefit, but there's so many women leaders that we, may have encountered uh, and that I'm sure you encounter through your coaching that feel mm -hmm. that in order to be successful, they mm -hmm. have to take on what they think are the most, um, these more masculine qualities. And maybe in some ways, um, um, you know, kind of elevate those or have a higher place of higher value on those than some of the more, um, qualities that are associated with women. I don't want to generalize gender or anything, right? right? But right. Um, there's a lot of studies that do say, yeah, women are more systemic thinkers. Women are natural connectors. Um, mm -hmm. They can be more empathetic. Uh, these are natural things. It's not to say anyone, you know, no one can learn these things, but what comes natural. But, you know, so many women, they end up you know, kind of almost dismissing those because they're looking at what has led to success mm -hmm. and who's the model in front of them and what do they do. And so try to emulate those, uh, which are largely going to be men, uh, mm -hmm. try to emulate those qualities, thinking that that is going to be successful. And I, yeah. I mean, that's what I heard, heard, that's what I'm hearing you say with that, the woman that you were coaching and I bet you encounter that quite a bit. I do. I encounter it. Uh, I have even, I encountered it even in my career um, mm -hmm. where I worked for someone, uh, for a woman who's extremely bright, very sharp, um, very creative. Um, one of my maybe third or fourth HR jobs, I can't remember. 
she was abusive. She was a mentally abusive manager. And I will have to say it was EEO. She didn't care who you were. You know, it yeah. wasn't, I, it didn't matter. And I remember her telling me, she also told me, I picked up on these, these this is what I saw. Right. Not to say that all men are, I'm not right, saying right. that. We're not here to bash men because there's some oh, excellent no. men Absolutely. leaders. Yeah, That's, and a lot of my mentors, uh, almost all of my yeah. mentors have been men, yes. honestly. Yes. So there are some great men leaders. So we're not here to, to, to do anything. Right, to, right. To, to do that. But, yeah. but, uh, but when you don't see someone that looks like you, right? And yeah. in this case, she was older than me. So, you know, and being a woman, she was probably one of the first to, you know, to be in the role that she was in as an executive in that organization. So, you know, there's this pressure on us on, in terms of how do we show up? And I always get back to, you know, uh, just being authentic, you know, that that is a part of, you know, we, we have to be who we are. I mean, you know, I've told this story many times, and this was years ago, I heard, um, I think it was, uh, was it Rosie? It was actually Roseanne, actually. And, uh, and she was interviewing Oprah and she asked Oprah, she, she said, Oprah, I want to be like you, you know, because during this time, Roseanne had her own talk show. Right. She said, I remember that. Yeah. And Oprah said, you can't be like me. The greatest strength comes from being who you are. Mm. That's, that's the imprint. That's the footprint. That is the, um, that is when you are the change maker. And, uh, but what happens and, you know, and my framework kind of gets to this is that you have all these historical narratives and social norms and our lived experiences, things that we've, you know, that we have experienced in our life and what we've been told, how we should be, you know, versus being free and removing some of those boundaries of yeah. that and being who we are and being okay with that and not comparing ourselves to other people because yeah. we're all different. We're all different and we all bring something unique to the table, right? Yes. And, um, you know, so I, I love that and, and you alluded to your framework. So let's go there. Um, Cheryl, just in your, you know, doctoral studies as well as your, um, corporate experience and now as a as an entrepreneur and, and coaching and consulting you have you know looked you've been around women leaders and and using all of that that you've uh, learned and 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 the practical side of it you've developed a model uh, that uh, can help women leaders right it's all about developing women leaders today and and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that model, explain it to us, and, and why did you come up with it? Yes. Well, you know, when I um, was uh, doing my research several years ago and interviewing women, uh, and in this case, African-American women, and, and I know I've shared with you um, uh, that there were similarities in terms of how these women achieved success in organizations. And the women that I interviewed were... Uh, women that uh, several of them reported directly to the CEO and they worked for uh, Fortune 100 companies. And I wanted to identify the strategies that they used to, to oppose at that time to get academic. It was about, you know, the uh, resistance strategies that they used against what I call gendered everyday racism. Um, but it was really, how did you break through the concrete ceiling? Mm -hmm. You know, because for women, uh, uh, especially women of color, I would say women in general, it's the glass ceiling. Women of color, it's a concrete ceiling because at that time, you know, these women, you know, were trailblazers. Uh, they couldn't see above, there was a concrete ceiling. They couldn't see us anywhere. So right. they were change agents. And, um, and so I, uh, and what I found out were the strategies that they use are very relevant for, uh, for women in general. And so I, you know, I have created leadership development uh, programs and I thought, you know what, I have all the content, all the, just with experience, having coached, and then also with my research to come up with a framework to yeah. help with um, organizations to uh, create their leadership development programs for women, uh, whether, you know, if it's all women, if it's women of color, 
Uh, and that also as, as I'm coaching, there are, these are some of the things that I always have to keep up front, front and center, you know, um, with, uh, with women. And, uh, and that's how I came up with really the framework. That's and, exciting. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so walk us through it. Walk us through your, I'll give you a high level. Framework. Yeah. I'll give you a high level. Okay. So I think, I think that not all uh, DEI programs or organizations don't think about the broader context, but I believe that sometimes that is left out, you know, because we live in this larger system, like I said before, and the, the, the organization is a microcosm of that larger system. So we don't take into consideration those historical narratives. You know, what are the historical narratives about women? right? You know, what were they taught? Uh, what did they hear? How did they formulate their belief system? You know, the same thing with no social norms. You know, um, how do I show up in the workplace and how am I treated? You know, like, for example, um, it's so funny that I never found myself sitting at the head of the conference table when it was a meeting I was leading, right? Mm -hmm. Now, some people would say that is but I always felt that I was there to really just kind of facilitate, you know, not necessarily the one to, to drive, you know, oh no, mm -hmm. you don't drive. That's not, so, so, uh, and then the other thing is, and, and I think I shared with you, I've been writing, actually, I'm writing a book on my experience with mom and her illness. And, um, you know, I started thinking about these fixed narratives that we have mm -hmm. uh, and the fixed narratives that I had as a caretaker and the expectations from family and friends. And how do you, you know, deal with all of that and, and become aware of it because awareness is key. Um, yeah, so and when you say fixed narratives, you know, as being a caretaker when your mom was ill, um, what, what are some fixed narratives you believe um, exist you know, for, for, for women and men. I, I think the thing, Cheryl, and maybe you can um, expound upon this or affirm it or tell me I'm <laughs> off, off, off track here, but these socialization uh, messages, norms, all of that for women, the, the thing about it is women inter internalize it, but mm -hmm. men also operate from those you know, okay. how they even think about women and, right. and so it can also be that. Yes. So it's not just the messages I might've gotten as uh, a woman or you got, Hey, you don't sit at the table. You're not the driver. You're the facilitator. Yes. Um, the, these messages came from somewhere and they get reinforced, you know, mm -hmm. by men and women in, in society. Mm -hmm. And then they show up in our, in our organizations. Exactly. You're exactly right. And that is, you know, um, I just recently um, put together a program for uh, an organization and, you know, no contract signed or anything yet with it. Um, but instead of just focusing on, in this case, it's people of color in leadership, right? So men and women, I felt that you have to bring in their man, they, the managers and their sponsors have to also understand how they may be contributing to, you know, if it is like their own unconscious bias right, um, and how they play a role. And it may not be intentional, but it does happen because, and, and to me, when I talk about fixed narratives, that's what I'm saying. So you're not smart mm -hmm. enough. You're, you're, you're pretty over here, but I would never send you to a meeting where, it, where, it, where it's related to strategy, you know, where it's related to, mm -hmm. um, discussing the strategic direction of the organization. Uh, I don't see you there, uh, you know, and I see you in more of a helping role, a supportive role, um, and, that, and that happens. And, yeah. um, and I've had that, I mean, I've had that happen. I mean, it's just, and this is not about me, but um, where, you know, you know, the infamous, you're sitting in the conference room and no one is looking at you, right? You're the, and it and not even realizing that that is that's real yeah so it is both yeah. and you are right we do it to even each other right women do it to other women you know people of color do it to other people of color there's this competition that occurs mm -hmm. right 
and and you know you've been through it. I know you've yeah. been through that. You oh yeah, I've been through that. career competition between another female. Leader, yes, yes. You know? yeah. And I, it was the most uncomfortable thing to me because I'm not wired that way, you know. Yeah. And but, um, but I felt it, and it was quite uncomfortable um, for this competition because the competition is really comes from a scarcity mindset, like. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's not enough of, of this pie. So I'm going to compete with you for this pie. And, and I think that just, that, that does exist inside of these corporate systems. Yeah, yes, yes. So, um, so all of that, I mean, it, it affects, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I go back to um, old research, um, Cantor's research. Oh yeah, Rosemary, Rosemary Cantor, Cantor, yes. Yes. And the, you know, and the, the token dynamics, and that was back in 1977, 78. And so I think about where we are. And, you know, I was thinking about even women, African American women who are in leadership roles. Uh, I was looking at the fortune, you know, 100 most influential women, I think there were like maybe four or five of us, you know, like we're not in, you know, we, you may be CEO of a division in the organization, but not for the entire corporation, right. right? So we still have work to do. And so I think understanding that it does exist and, and it's not saying that you're a horrible person, you know, right. um, but, it, but it is there. And so with, uh, and women need to know what they're dealing with themselves. You know, the, the, right. the stories that they may tell themselves that aren't even real. Yeah. Aren't even true. Yeah. All these limiting yeah. beliefs and the imposter yes. syndrome, inner critic stories that we tell ourselves. So, yes. so one of the first things you said is, is in, in your model, in your framework is understanding, you know, the societal cues and messages and how mm -hmm. they make themselves make, make their way into our corporate systems because corporate systems are just microcosms of the larger society so that's kind of the first thing right in your framework first thing that's the first yeah. thing and then i go into the organization okay. and so how does that affect advocacy for women how does that affect mentoring for women how does that affect de uh, uh diversity equity and inclusion you know programs and the receptivity of those programs in the organization um, you know, how does it uh, affect um, our, our lived experiences as women in the organization? Who selected to, to participate in high potential leadership development programs? You know, who's in the pipeline? You know, um, and, uh, and so, and then it also, I think about, it impacts the, because what I've failed to mention, the, in the larger uh, context is the multiple identities and how they converge. So the intersectionality of these multiple identities, you know, so as a black female intersecting a, a black and being female, how does that inter intersect and create what I experience as a white female? How does that intersect, you know, female and being white? What kind of experiences? Because there are norms and stories around that. So how does that show up in the organization? Uh, and so the, the, what happens, you have, you know, you find sometimes that women are exhausted, they're stressed, you know, this is the negative, the, the negative things that can occur as a result of that. Um, they're stressed. I have a couple of things I would just want to read to you. Uh, they yeah, feel sure. And I, I see Marley, Marley is barking and he, okay. um, he sees someone, you know, out outside hold, hold on i'm gonna pause us okay okay all right we're back cheryl we're back i had to i had to go get marley he was you know barking up the place and seeing a dog outside okay so uh okay. yeah okay. all right so sorry to interrupt you um with that but i know he can get on a barking okay. spell that's okay. and um you know so i just wanted to bring Don't it worry. back up here close to me Parker came in to visit me. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I have to just shoo him out. Like, no, no, I don't have time. So. I know, I know. They're, they're our, our puppies. We love them, but they can, they can, um, you know, do what they want to do when they want to do it. 
Um, okay, so where were we? We were talking about, oh my God, where were we? I can we? tell you, you were, I'll tell you. Really talking about the, you were getting into the model and you said there was something you wanted to read. Yes, so, so I, was, I was talking about how these, these larger forces uh, external to the organization, internal to the organization, and what they can cause, you know, in terms of our well-being, the well-being of women. And, uh, and so there's isolation, alienation, uh, had marginalization, stress, low productivity, esteem issues, uh, negative and, 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 you know, negative competition, you know, because competition is okay, but there's this, this negative competition that you and I just talked about. Um, but the idea is that, like, from the women that I, that I uh, interviewed is they helped me to identify four pathways to being successful, you know, yeah. even um, in spite of all these things that they may encounter. And not to say that all women encounter some of these things, because there's some organizations that are more progressive than others you know, uh, and they see, you know, the value and what women have to bring. And uh, so the idea is to, to have women who are resilient, that they are accepted, that they are included, that they're thriving, you know, that they're purpose driven, you know? And so the four pathways, and I'm going to look at this as, as we're talking here. Yeah, that's um, fine. So, okay. So first yeah. pathway. Okay. The first one is, um, is I call it um, purpose-driven pathways. And this has to do with things that we usually don't wanna talk about in the organization, but they really should be a part of leadership programs. And it's around, it is around spirituality. It is around our value system. You know, it is around what is important, you know, to us, what is our North Star? Um, you know, I, uh, I think about it when years ago, I don't know if you were still at Turner at the time, and uh, we brought in uh, Deepak Chopra, um, actually for one of the, uh, the uh, BRG groups, uh, it was actually the Asian group. Okay. And, um, and so I had the opportunity, there, was like, there were like maybe 12 of us that had lunch with him. Now he won't remember Cheryl Jordan, right? I mean, the man is like- <laughs> He probably does, Cheryl, he remembers you. But anyway, um, he had just finished meditating with his leadership team, with the leadership team in the organization, in Turner. And he said to, it was mostly a group of women, which it just stays with me, when women recognize they pow their power, they will change the world. Oh, yeah. They will change the world. And we see it happening right in front of us. Yeah, yeah. We, we do. see it. We see it. And so, um, so a lot of times we, you know, it's okay to talk about what is important to you, your values, you know, you don't have to talk about religion, you know, but it, it is those things that, you know, the people that inspired you growing up, like who were those individuals? Yeah. Whose shoulders do you stand on? Because it's a way of uplift, of uplifting women to say, you know what, I got this. You yeah. know, so-and-so grandmother over here did this, or Aunt Susie, you know, or, you know, my, um, uh, great great grandmother, whoever came across on on the the uh, the the in, this ship for people who are enslaved, or I came from you know Germany or wherever. Like those individuals, when they came here, they had strength. They were yeah. bold. Yeah. And sometimes remembering and memorializing those individuals and the people in our lives is a way to empower ourselves. Uh, yeah. So. So that is, uh, and that's then I, the first pathway. The first pathway is really just kind of, um, is the first pathway spirit, purpose driven pathway, or is the whole yeah. thing called purpose? So it's, the first it's purpose driven pathways. Okay. And, and their spirituality, memorializing others, um, and identifying your why as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. I love, love, love that you said getting understanding what your values are because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know our, our values guide everything you know we wonder how we make decisions and and you know how we even assess right wrong does this feel good 
you know, it, a lot of times it's, it's leading us right back to our core values. Mm -hmm. And so when people don't understand what their values are, I say they can be tossed around like, like a, a, a ship out at, at a mm -hmm. sea in the middle of a storm, they can be tossed around. But when you know your values and you align to those, then you can be more authentic yes. um, with who you really are and know what your North Star um, mm. or your North Stars are. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So purpose, and you're right, we don't talk about it enough, but we're starting. I mean, I think what is a great thing is I, um, I'm i starting to read a lot and, and even in my own experience at my company, getting getting people to talk about mm -hmm. you know purpose mm -hmm. finding purpose at work finding purpose even outside of work and i think that's a that's a great thing and for for this to be included in your one of your pathways for developing um yes. women leaders is is pretty awesome cheryl no thank you thank you i um i was just thinking that um I read this book, it was a long time ago. I think I mentioned it to you before, called The Soul's Code. See, S-O-L, S-O-U-L, Code. C-O-D, okay. the, the Soul's Code. And, you know, and in this book, um, the author talked about how, you know, and this might sound a little arcane, right? But he talked about how um, when we are born, that we are born either with a daemon, some people call it Holy Spirit, you know, depend but it's in us. And so uh, the chapter that really struck me is when he was talking about children and how we raise our children and uh, how it is up to us to see that in our children, right? And so, right. you know, he talks about like a little girl who asked for a, a violin when she was three years old and the, for Christmas and the parents brought her like a toy violin and she cried. She wanted the real thing and she ended up playing in the symphony orchestra as wow. an adult. Yeah. You know, or the little boy who had just started working, walking and he drags a sack of books around in a pillowcase, right? He ends up becoming a writer. And yeah. sometimes like we lose sight of that. There's something in, in that. Like for me, even I was extremely shy. I remember in the second grade, whenever the teacher had asked someone to, uh, they wanted to read, I was the first one. <laughs> My hand went up. It shot up. I, so... You know, it's those things that, you know, that bring those things that were in us from the very beginning, the right? In the beginning, and we yeah. lose sight of it. Yeah. We lose it. All right. We got to keep it moving. We're, okay. we're probably not okay. doing great on time, but, you know, right. this is how right. it is when we talk, right? Okay. We just talk. Yes. What's, what's yes. your second? What's the second one? Uh, so this, the second one is, um, it's really uh, a pathway really to self it's more around agency it's around um you know like understanding your identity you know uh feeling empowered building confidence you know um so uh so some of the areas in that are for example learning how to you know advocate for self you know learning how to uh confront for self you know, how do you, if you're sitting in a conference room with, you know, and you're, you are one of the only few women that is, you're sitting there and you feel like you're not being a part of the conversation, how can you reframe in that moment, that thought that you have, how can you switch it, you know, and look at it from a, from a different, a different place, you know, uh, because what can happen is when you feel like you're not being noticed, then you kind of, you shrink. How can you become bigger? How can you look at it in a different way, if that makes sense? So yeah, yeah. Uh, reflecting socially, like constructing the reality and being very strategic, um, you know, uh, reaching out to people to help you with what does that, what does that mean? What does it look like? You know, um, you know, having a friend like you, you help me when I may be at a loss for, I don't know how to deal or strategize to, okay, Cheryl, this, okay, this is what I'm hearing, right? <laughs> You know, and so sometimes that means having to reach out to others, which is another pathway. You yeah. know, it oh, is the, another, okay. It's the external, it's building, it is recognizing that that it's not all about you. That part of your leadership is to uplift others and to pay it forward, 
hoping that they will pay it forward one one day as well. So is that and a third? Is that is that a third pathway up the third path pathway. of others? Okay. Um, it's it's more a, an external path. The focus is on external. Okay. So not not yourself, but on others. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so so it's the same thing. Like, uh, how are you advocating? Are you advocating for other women? Right? Mm. Or, or are you competing? You know, are you confronting when you hear someone say something that is totally like, it, you know, it, it, it is, uh, it denigrates another woman, you know, what do you say? You know, are you, are you, are you, you know, really advocating for other women in general? And uh, it's coaching others. It's educating others. It doesn't have to be women, but, you know, building awareness. I, I interviewed one woman who said I had to, I had to tell my manager that if you hire this person for this role, and she's known for maybe not necessarily um, uh, being open-minded about a diverse group of people, right? This is, this is, you need to know this. Or I remember another woman telling me, another leader telling me that her manager wanted her, you know, and she's a senior leader. He's like, I want you to move to Iowa. And she said, I don't want to go to Iowa. There's no one who looks like me in Iowa. Don't you understand? You know, because we do want to be with people who are, that we can relate to. Not to say that she couldn't relate to anyone in Iowa. But there are cultural, we, particularly women of color, live a biculturalistic existence at times. Yes. And that's the reality. And that's, that's the reality. That's, Just that's understanding, the, yeah, under, being understanding of our different cultural yes. identities, our personal identities, and, and how all of that can impact us. I know even in my doctoral research, that was one of the conclusions drawing out of that, is that mm -hmm. your personal and cultural identity are so instrumental to your career success and how you navigate um, your career. So that makes sense. So we have three, if I'm counting this right. So yeah, yes, purpose, this purpose driven there. pathway that is more spiritual about who you are, what you value, what your North star uh, or North stars are. Mm -hmm. The second one is really uh, a pathway to self and your uh -huh. own sense of agency uh -huh. and knowing that learning how to advocate for yourself uh, mm -hmm. is important. And then mm -hmm. this third pathway is more externally uh, focused and, and um, learning how to uplift and advocate for others and support mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Am I tracking well? Yeah, you are tracking. Okay. You are good at synthesizing things. And uh, you know, yes, so yes. Good. It's so good. And I, I think it takes a whole nother show just to go deeper on, on these things. So what's the fourth one, Cheryl? Okay. So the fourth one is um, the in infrastructure pathway. So, so that is um, in how do you influence the structure? Like if you are in a role where you have some type of, in, you know, you have some kind of influence or where you see that, you know, you look at your numbers and you can say, okay, women are only like 5% of our senior leadership. We only have one one woman, you know, female, right, mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, the C-suite, um, how can you, so someone that's working in HR, for example, they see that, how do you address that? It's an infrastructure issue if there are no, if there are not a lot of women, people of color, whoever, in the pipeline, who is challenging that, right? So the other one was more about, you know, advocating for people, right? This right. is like advocating for changing the systems and structures that exist in the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's such a great framework, these pathways and these pathways. Um, oh, before I get to that, because my mind now is like, like twirling. Yeah, I but see you thinking. I see you thinking. Yeah, yeah. I, I love, love, love this fourth one as well. I like them all, honestly. But this thing of interrogating the systems um, mm -hmm. that we're, because organ, 
you know, organizations are, are hu basically human systems. Mm -hmm. And how do we interrogate those systems so that people uh, can, um, you know, so that there is greater diversity, equity, and inclusion, and sense of belonging mm -hmm. inside of an organization. And again, some of these systems have been um, built and cultivated and nurtured and reinforced over time unconsciously and unintentionally. Mm -hmm. And it's not until we interrogate those systems, really delve into them mm -hmm. to see who they are helping and who might they be hurting. Yes. And, and then that way we can, we can start to equalize, uh, equalize them more. Um, but I, I love that this is the path. These are the pathways for women. Mm -hmm. um, and again, having purpose, sense of self and, and the agency, sense of others, mm -hmm. and also then being aware of, of, the, of the need and the power Mm -hmm. to influence the structures in which um, we yes. all work. Yes. Wow. That's it, Tanya. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Girl, that's yeah. so good. And so at the end of it all, say we have, you know, we have women that are much more informed and authentic around, you know, who they are and what they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. They're great at advocating for themselves. Uh, they're great at advocating and being great allies to others, um, and they are influencing a system where everyone can have this sense of belonging. What's the net net of that, Cheryl? What what comes out of that? Um, I think that uh, what comes out of it is our our women who are, as I said you know, earlier, who are really thriving, who have uh, equal opportunity who can bring um, themselves, their authentic self to the workplace and even be vulnerable. Uh, I think it can create a sisterhood, you know, where women come together, creating community, you know, together and saying, okay, you know, how, how can we address, you know, this issue or, and then I think it's also bringing, you know, uh, men into the fold, right? Who partnerships were helping, you know, helping women, you know, with, yes. with that. So I, I believe that. And I think that, you know, uh, the pipeline will be, you know, it'll open up for um, a diverse, you know, group of, of, uh, of women. And, uh, and we won't walk in fear and we'll feel like we belong. We right. belong. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The sense of belonging. Yeah. Yes. So if there is one thing from, say we have women leaders or even male leaders who uh -huh. want to be greater supporters, advocates, sponsors of, of women in their growth and development in organizations, what is one thing that they can do after listening to this podcast or watching us today? What are one thing you would say, hey, you can, this is a step that you can take? So I think that um, for especially um, for men and, and I would say for uh, white males and even for, for everybody, you know, I love the book White Fragility because not only, because even though it goes, it's more around race, I think that uh, there are some similarities, right? Um, that biases, you know, grounded in, in uh, patriarch, patri patriarchal ideology, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, um, I think being aware that you don't know, you, that it, and it's okay, and to reach out, you know, to others to get a sense of, so tell me what's really happening, you know, changing your world, you know, not going home to your, your home and staying within that cocoon, you know, but going out to other communities, you know, interacting with other communities that may be very different from your own community. Um, I, those are some of the things that I think about, you know, immediately yeah. spending more time with people on your teams that are different than you are, you know, uh, that's, how you, that's how you learn. I mean, you can't necessarily put yourself in their shoes because you don't have, their, you haven't lived their experiences. You know, but the more questions that you ask and, you know, I know that you're a, a Peter Block fan and, and, yes. and 
you know, and how powerful questions can be. Yes. Yeah, so know? I, as you were saying that, that's what was in my head is that mm -hmm. it's the, the questions mm -hmm. are the answer. I mean, yes, you know, having yes. powerful questions can, can lead to change. Yes. So, yeah. The sheer nature of asking the question will help make me think about, okay, you know, am I going to go, you know, am I going to the store after I, after we get finished? And then, I'm, and it, and it creates action. There's some action that comes from action. that. Yeah. 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 And being sincerely interested and curious yes. And, yes. and inquisitive about it. And if, with, with the motivation to do something, how, how can I help and how can I contribute? So yeah. Cheryl, we're at the end. Um, okay, we're at the end great. of our time. I mean, it, went, yeah. it goes pretty fast, but I have a final question for you. It's, it's mm -hmm. the aha question. So of course, okay. this um, podcast is called Your Aha Life. Mm -hmm. And I believe the uh, aha life is an awakened life. That's the aha mm -hmm. part of it. But when we awaken to ourselves and to the world around us, and it can spark within us and it can lead us to a life of more joy, more purpose, and more fulfillment. And so I want to ask you, how do you define um, the aha life and how are you living your aha life? Um, I, I look at it as a, uh, a journey of self-discovery all, all the time. That is to me an aha life. Um, that, that, I mean, I'm not saying that you should not live in the present, you know? Um, but I think that, that recognizing that there's so much that we don't know. And so for me, it's, it's the learning. It is, and how I take that learning and apply that learning in my life to make a difference. And one of the things that I do, and uh, I do, I, I meditate every single day now. I mean, when I was looking at the number of hours that I've meditated, it's been like thousands. So I've been meditating yes. every day for like four years. And, uh, and I try different types of meditation. Sometimes it's just, you know, me not listening, it's not guided, but, right. um, but that's, that to me is, and remaining, that to me is how, I'm able to take in these aha moments uh, and, and knowing that, that there is, things are always changing. Um, they're always changing. And, uh, and how do I, knowing, I think about Peter Vail and the permanent whitewater, that that's what it is. And so I have to always work on myself and always remain open to what comes my way. And I don't always do a good job of that. You know, different ideas. It's like, okay, you need to, think about this. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. That's so good. And um, thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on your AHA Life and sharing your wisdom and your passion for developing uh, women leaders and the systems that they uh, work in every day. And so Thank you. You'll, you'll have to come back and, and share uh, again uh, another time, Cheryl. So thanks so much for joining. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. And thanks for doing this. This is great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Tanya Harris Cornelius. Come back again in another couple of weeks for a brand new episode. Hit the subscribe button and I'll see you soon.